All right, today is the day. Now this video is not an Arate video or a Leviathan video. We are going to be calling these Saturday's solutions, at least in the playlist here on YouTube. If you ever want to search those, those will be the projects that kind of fall between the automotive projects, but do have some aspect in the manufacturing process and the things I do here in the studio. Anyway, we're going to be doing a little foundry casting today, working on a project for another a fellow YouTuber named David Guyton, who operates a YouTube channel where he does armor templates. Anyway, let's just jump into the video and I'll talk to you more about that. Let's go look at it. When I say it makes templates, that's just a part of what he does. He creates all this armor and uh, sells templates so that you can recreate the pieces yourselves. But he has a whole gambit from uh, more modern stuff to ballistic stuff into this old English type thing with very artistic flair to it. Now I, he also, of course, is an automotive enthusiast. And with the 65 Impala, he's done a bunch of work too, has some videos for it for uh, doing this engine bay cleanup. And has done a bunch of interior upholstery, dash reconstruction, all some pretty incredible work, really nice in the car and in the armor. But one of the things that really caught my attention when I was looking through David's uh, videos was he does these recreations of these jetpacks from the movie The Rocketeer a movie I really do really love. And he has a problem in producing these things and creating this little blister piece. So I said, hey, why don't we uh, try to build you a die that you can use to do some hammer forming into. So he created this pattern and sent it to me. And I'm gonna take it and create a, another pattern from it that we're gonna use as a pattern to do some sand casting. So one of the things I need to do first off is to uh, take his pattern, which kind of flares up on the edges and has a little bit of a gap underneath it. I need to fill that gap before I can start uh, creating the piece. And once I've got the clay filling that gap, I'm going to put it into this box and put a coat of epoxy on it. Now I've previously, without being in the video, put some release agent on it so all this doesn't stick together. And then I mixed up some epoxy with some calcium carbonate in it. Now the calcium carbonate just makes the epoxy when it sets up be just a little bit harder in case I need to do some sanding and touch up and working on the surface of this die that we're going to create. Got a good working surface. Now in the end, we're going to create this die out of uh, some pour in polyurethane foam, but just to make sure that this shell that we're creating, this epoxy shell is strong enough to withstand a little, uh, hammering when we go to do some tamping of the sand in the sand casting. We're going to put a couple of coats of uh, some thin epoxy and some fiberglass on to reinforce our uh, calcium carbonate shell. Now once we get a layer of epoxy on there, we're going to go ahead and uh, fill this box the rest of the way up with some expanding polyurethane foam. Mix the two parts together, stand back and just let it do its thing. Now I've got some tape around the edge of this box so that the foam doesn't come up and bond to the part of the box that I do not have release agent on. I'm gonna throw a piece of uh, plastic on there and a piece of cardboard, just kind of hold it down, get a little pressure, increase the density of that foam so it just doesn't pour out. And once, uh, give it 10 minutes, once it's cured, you can uh, start stripping it down. Just a matter of uh, tearing apart this box that we use to create our uh, form. And then I'm going to try to break this thing free from the glass that I put it on. But I'm finding that uh, take a little bit of pressure on it. I don't want to put too much pressure on it and break the glass. So slowly working some wedges in there. Now, one thing that we did use PVA as a releasing agent, so I'm make sure I don't put too much pressure. I'm just going to pour some water in there since the PVA is water soluble. This is always a good way if you get something that sticks with PVA, just put some water on there and let it sit for a while. Water starts to dissolve the PVA and then it tends to be a little bit easier to release. And of course it worked, pops loose. Now it's just a matter of uh, taking Dave's original pattern out and the clay that I added to it. We'll just gouge that out with a plastic spatula, a few wedges, and uh, 
the original pattern comes out. We'll clean this thing up and get ready for the next step. Now, originally when I had planned to do this thing, I did not really understand the size of it, but I just kind of went forward with the idea that I had in my head when this thing arrived from Dave. And I'm going to cut this thing down. And this was originally the size of the die that I was going to create was this whole kind of boxy looking thing. But after uh, trimming this foam off and seeing the actual size of the thing, I realized this is going to be about 65 pounds of aluminum. And I just have no way to pour that much. So it took a moment. I gave Dave a call and talked to him about what it was going to take to do this and decided that the best thing to do is just to reduce it, put it on a diet. So I'm going to cut away most of the mass of this thing in the foam and then do some reshaping. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut it down so that the whole thing is only three quarters of an inch thick rather than these huge box sections. I'm showing you here uh, cutting off the main mass of this thing, but I also took some uh, sandpaper and files and uh, reshaped it down, like I said, so everything's only about three quarters of an inch thick. And I'm sorry, but I didn't catch video of the shaping of it beyond this uh, trimming down. But you'll see just in a moment what I'm talking about with the shape of this thing and reducing its weight. So here it is. Also going to go ahead and probe this thing with a piece of wire just so I can see that I've got my thickness I want. And everything seems good. So I'm going to now uh, put the same kind of a shell on the backside that I created from that original casting an epoxy with the fiberglass. So you've seen this on the Airtape project, me using this uh, slurry, which is a uh, epoxy with a uh, micro spheres mixed into it to thicken it up. So I've coated this whole thing up and before it cures, I'm just going to put some peel ply on it and then just use this little plastic piece to uh, smooth it out. Just save me a bunch of sanding time. The peel ply, I can just uh, tear off once the thing's cured and uh, it'll be fairly smooth right there, won't require as much sanding. Another thing I'm going to do is in the end here is uh, throw a piece of plywood on top. Now these three little parts that stick up, they're a little bit thicker there than the three quarters I mentioned because they're going to create some legs so this will be the feet of this die when it sits down on the workbench for you to work on. Now again I missed a little piece here, I was putting the fiberglass layer on top of that uh, mix and the sanding. Of course you don't really want to ever see me sanding anymore, huh? As much as I love doing it, you probably don't want to watch me sand every time you see a video. Well, we got some fiberglass on there and we're going to put one more coat of uh, slurry with some microspheres, a little thinner this time. This coat's just going to be a good shining surface. And once it was sanded, I just uh, painted the thing up with some John Deere green. Don't have a tractor to paint, so I used the green on this. And now I'm just doing a displacement test. I filled this uh, stainless steel bucket to the edge with water and I'm going to immerse our pattern into the water and my fist because I need to occupy a little space and get a measurement by water. Now this little crucible is what I would normally have poured in but I also have a steel crucible that I usually melt down scrap aluminum to clean it up and it's a little bit bigger probably the biggest thing I have to pour aluminum and there's my volume of water to show wow. the mass and it's not enough. I'm going to have to add about 15% aluminum to make it. Now this crucible has plenty of room in there, so I decided, I guess, it's just to have to make up another steel crucible for this project. And I didn't show you a video of making that crucible. You'll see it later on here as we get ready to pour this thing. But now it's time to take our pattern and ram it up with some sand, get ready to pour some aluminum. So take the pattern, since it's brand new, I need to coat it with some uh, releasing powder, mostly made up of talc and calcium carbonate mix. And whenever you're doing sand casting, uh, things are the releasing agent you use is this uh, release powder. Now this is an oil-based sand, so it has moisture from water in it as well, but most of it, the binding occurs because there's some oil in it, which makes a really nice and s kind of smooth consistency sand to work with. And I have uh, put some sand on there with a riddle, the screen, 
that's just to reduce the having a chunk fall in there that might leave a little air gap against the pattern. So you use the riddle to kind of sift your sand on top of the pattern. Get a nice smooth layer against it. Now it's just a matter of uh, adding more sand and going around with our ram and uh, packing the sand around this thing. We just keep going in layers after layers. I really wish I could work this fast rather than just uh, speeding the video up to get this kind of effect. Still need to be kind of careful as I get close to the pattern before I get sand built over it. But as I get around the edges, of course, I can uh, pack it as hard as I need to, tap it down with that rammer. And we'll just keep working this up until we get this box completely full. Now, one thing I was not expecting in this as well is that we've reduced the volume of our pattern, but I still have to use a fairly large cope and drag the box we're using to put all the sand in. And I had to create it for this. This is the largest piece I have ever done in sand casting. Most of my experience is in uh, lost wax and ceramic shale casting. So had to build this box just for this project and did not realize it was gonna take as much sand. In the end, I will use three bags of sand at 50 pounds a piece. So this whole cope and drag setup weighed 150 pounds and you're gonna see the problems that creates for me here just a little bit. Typically in a foundry that does sand casting and they get into any kind of patterns this large, they would have a overhead crane to move these things around. And they would also have a pneumatic tampers to uh, pound the sand out or even a big pneumatic press that just uh, crush the sand in in one fell go. And we'll just do it in our uh, lifts. Keep adding more lifts filling in the holes. And then we're gonna add a piece of plywood to uh, hold this all together. Typically in a smaller cope and drag setup that the sand is uh, rigid enough to just hold itself here and you don't have to put a back on it. But this time I just wanted to make sure I didn't have something, either the cope or the drag side fall out. Also threw in a little piece of steel because my pattern is only about three quarters of an inch from the surface of that sand. Didn't want to set my board on fire, which is kind of a foreshadowing of things that come, you'll see. Now I've turned this, I've turned the cope over here. Now I'm going to start cleaning up and get ready to pull the pattern out. And I want the seam to be down at the midsection of the pattern rather than right at the corner edge. So I'm taking my little uh, tool going around and uh, removing the sand about 45 degree angle down to that edge that I want the parting line to be at. This will also help me to be able to pull the pattern out without uh, pulling out a chunk of sand as well. Just go around and clean things up, get my sand out of there. Now things are just about ready. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put some more releasing powder on there. Get it nice and heavy on the sand so that we don't get our sands binding together. And we'll uh, sweep it off our pattern, clean it up so that we don't have a irregular surface from the releasing powder showing up in the sand itself. So now the release on there, let's put the drag on top and we'll just go in reverse and start putting the sand in there and doing our ram up. Same thing, get our riddle sift in some good clean sand so that we don't get any air pockets from a lump of some kind in there. And then once we get a, some good sifted sand in there, we can just start loading it up as fast as we can. Of course, if you try to fill the whole thing at one time with sand and try to tamp it down, you're going to just get it too soft and not enough uh, compression in the sand to 
have any kind of a strength to hold the whole the whole setup together. So we'll do the same thing, put some sand around the edges and start uh, ramming it up around the edges and then working slowly around the pattern so that we don't uh, damage the pattern itself, even though it is pretty durable with the fiberglass layers in there. Now I'm a little bit of a beginner in this uh, sand casting world. Like I said, most of my experience has been in the Lost Wax ceramic shell. But it is uh, nice in that it doesn't take any time. We can uh, put a bowl together in sand in one day, whereas the ceramic shell takes a extended period of time to build up the, the layers, let them dry, add more layers, and let them dry. We'll be doing some of that in the near future building some parts for the Arete and some hinges and things like that. I say the my experience is in ceramic shale because uh, I grew up with my father having a foundry. He was an artist and did uh, some sculpture and uh, when I was young, he started building his own foundry. And so for years, I spent a lot of time in the foundry helping him create his artwork. That's what got me into the foundry world. Like I said, but now that I'm doing more industrial stuff, it makes sense to also have the ability to do some sand casting. Now we're getting this box just about full. We'll get it all rammed up. And then we need to do some uh, preparation to find a way to get our metal into the cavity now. And what we have to do is we have to uh, take a little tool here, a little sprue cutter, and we will drive it into the sand and it uh, pulls the core out. And we're now cutting what will be the vent. This will be the air that comes out here as the aluminum goes into the mold, pushing the air out of the way, gives it a good place to escape. Then on the opposite corner, we're gonna cut another sprue, a runner, that will be our pouring hole. And now again, this casting is bigger, this the biggest thing I've ever done sand casting. So this little uh, three quarter inch uh, sprue cutter is gonna cut a three quarter inch runner. I'll actually go on later on to enlarge it because I need to be able to get this metal in a little bit faster than that. And now we pulled the cope and the drag apart and now it's time to try to pull the pattern. So I'm putting some screws into it. Give us some way to get hold of it. And then uh, shake it a little bit to get it loose in the mold. Pull it up straight as you can. And there we have our uh, mold ready to go. Just a few more things to prep it here. I'm going to cut away a little bit. A gate, they call it. The connection between the vent. And then also a gate for the pouring side. So if you kind of picture this now, the hole where we cut our sprue or our runner in. Now we need to cut a connection between the, where the pattern was and that pouring hole. Also got this little round cutter that I'm going to cut a little well so that the Aluminum will go through our sprue, or our pour hole, go down to that little well, and then as that well fills up, then it will run through the runner or the gate into our cavity that where the pattern was. Now we want that little gate to be as large as possible because when this metal starts to cool, it will shrink. And as long as there's some molten metal nearby, it will kind of draw it into the mold. So. We will put a little cup on top of our sprue, our pouring hole, that we will try to fill with aluminum so that when the metal in the pattern cools, it will draw that metal in from that sprue hole. Now things are all cut, ready to go. We're just gonna clean up, dust out some of the loose sand. We'll do this again once we turn on its side to get the sand to fall out of that cavity. And now the trick is, and you can see my 
sun has come to help me because like I said, this is 150 pounds, like 70 pounds each side here. Now we've got to figure out how to get them together. And all this uh, mouse talk you're hearing is us discussing how we're going to do this without breaking something loose. Tip this things up and we will see if we can slide them together. I've decided uh, I want a little better view to make sure that we don't knock something loose inside. And it looks like we got them together. And I'm going to clamp this whole mechanism together just so we don't get any shifting as we try to pick it up and carry it outside. Now it's together. Time to try to move this thing. And there it is, ready to go. We are gonna get some metal melting. Put our... And it looks like it's melting down. Now you're about to see me pull this uh, steel crucible that I've welded up and see how much bigger I had to create a crucible to hold the 35 pounds of aluminum that it's going to take to fill this thing. It was calculated out to be about 30 pounds. In the end, it was really about 26 pounds without the sprues and stuff on it. I skimmed it off. Now I'm going to get a temperature, make sure I'm not too hot or too cold. I don't think you could have been too cold on this thing as long as we had some good flow in the aluminum because it's such a large mass that it would have flowed in, not in any particular detail. But we've got a good temperature, and I've got my son again here just to make sure that as I pick this thing up, 35 pounds of aluminum and 20 pounds of uh, steel crucible. I didn't want to be able to struggle as I try to hit a small hole on the pour. You see I got a little piece of scrap aluminum there to hold the little steel can that's going to be my overflow for my runner. We're just pouring past it. We want to pour as fast as we can, but not so fast that we uh, fill beyond our little steel canister. And it seemed to be taking aluminum just fine. The only thing that I was uh, surprised, I did not see anything come up the runner, and that's always a worrisome thing. Typically, the runner will start to fill, and you know that your uh, pattern is full. Didn't see any on the runner. But then we saw that the the filler side starting to fill up. So we figured we were good. Just going to pour off the extra aluminum in these uh, muffin tins. A little thing I've learned from other people doing this kind of thing. And about 30 minutes later, we decided it's time to open this thing up. The aluminum has cooled off plenty. And a, kind of an interesting phenomenon with that much mass of a hot aluminum. It is still extremely hot inside. And once we got a little oxygen hitting the heat in there, the oil in that sand, oil-based clay, oil-based clay, oil back to sand, I should say, started smoking. And we knocked the sand out of the drag side of this whole thing. And we're going to try to get our part out of there. Another thing I've never seen happen before is about to occur. Oh. A fetal attempt to blow out an oil fire. I was, yeah, I, yeah, I was not expecting that. Okay, where are my so I decided to better uh, drag this thing away from all the wood structure around it. 
even though it's sitting on some fireproof sand, get it out away from everything. Now I got two fires. I'm gonna make another feeble attempt at putting out an oil fire again. Send my lovely wife off to get a fire extinguisher here. Solve that problem. Oh, even more smoke. <laughs> So at first it looked like it was completely successful. And this is the bottom side and it was perfectly fine. But once we turned it, it over... It's pretty good on that side. Yeah. What? found that uh, yeah, the side, huh? it had actually collapsed slightly, and but it was well like along in the port. Right there. There's only one little uh, crack right there. I think. And I found out it was more than one little crack, but... What uh, goes inside like of this? He's going to hammer form aluminum into oh, okay. it. Okay. So we're going to clean sense. this thing up and uh, send it off to David, see if he can at least try to get one part out of it and see if it works. And I told him if it worked, then I would uh, just retry the casting again. Now that I knew what I was up against. And here's what it looked like cleaned up a little bit better. Of course, you can see on that left side, it had collapsed a little bit, but the main center section where actually the hammer forming was going to be done seemed to be pretty good shape. So like I said, we're going to send it off to David, let him give it a try. Well, there you have something a little bit different, and we have shipped that die off to David. And you can go catch his video. I will put a link in the description to David's channel, and he will have a video up of showing the use of that die. He had to do a little alterations to it, but it seems to be working for him. So go ahead, jump down, click on the link in that description and go see the conclusion of this video by seeing David use the die to create that blister for the Rocketeer jetpack. Anyway, I hope you haven't enjoyed the video today and we are glad that you stopped by and hope you come back and see us again.